I, I want to, again, thank the folks for, for presenting this and thank uh, the faculty and folks from the community and, and students for being here. I think it's going to be a fantastic presentation today. I'm, I'm really looking forward to it as one who taught human anatomy for 20 years. It's always interesting seeing how some of this uh, fits into, into practice. Now I want to introduce uh, Mr. Russ Reed, who is the executive director for the National Center for the Biotechnology Workforce. That's a mouthful. Russ, he's going to introduce our speaker. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, everybody. It's a pleasure to see you all. And thank you, Michael, for the great introduction and the note of thanks uh, regarding SciTech. SciTech is really um, uh, fantastic, as Michael said. But today, uh, we have a great speaker. And I'm really glad that people have taken the time from uh, just coming off a break and coming back to the college. Um, so it's my pleasure to introduce Jerry Barker um, uh, with his presentation, An Eye Towards Innovation. Um, uh, Jerry's company, OSI, is here in Winston-Salem, and it's a rapidly growing company, and it's a company that's just recently been honored. So I'm just going to give you a little bit of background because um, I think it's kind of cool when somebody uh, locally uh, actually is an entrepreneur and develops a company and then actually is just like us, you know, person that was striving to do something in education, um, then went on from their education, got a job, was doing well in their job, and then all of a sudden said, you know, I think I can do this on my own and do it with a team and build it and uh, make it into a business. So um, Jerry grew up and attended school in Gretna, Virginia, and I think that's near Danville. I did my Google search, and I think I might have even passed it passed through at one time. Um, after graduating from high school, he attended Cumberland College, and I think that's in Kentucky. Have I got that right? Okay. Where he received his bachelor's degree in biology with a minor in chemistry. That's exactly the undergraduate I took. Jerry, I think you knew that. Um, and following his graduation, he worked at Baptist Hospital of East Tennessee and then transitioned into eye banking. Eye banking. What made you think of going into eye banking? He can tell us that. Um, in um, East Tennessee Lions Eye Bank in Knoxville. Uh, and then subsequently, he moved to North Carolina as Director of Clinical Services at the North Carolina Eye Bank. In 2004, he left his eye banking um, position and established Ocular Systems, um, headquartered here in Winston, specializes in providing innovative solutions to physicians to help Im people improve their vision. Um, and at the core of OSI's service is processing corneas uh, for transplants. So since the inception of the company, over 10,000 patients have been served. That means 10,000 patients have better vision, thanks to OSI and its team. Um, in addition to processing the corneas, uh, OSI launched an innovative surgical device in 2011 called the Endoserger. So the corneal, cor corneal, corne corneal <laughs> endothelium delivery instrument eases specialized ophthalm ophthalmic procedures. I'm having a little trouble with those words today. Um, it puts cells into the eye, protecting the delicate corneal tissue from damage and requiring a smaller incision with no sutures and reduction of operation time. And I actually heard uh, an interesting lecture by a Dr. Timas recently, where he said that, you know, the less invasiveness that you have into the eye, the more rapid the recovery is uh, for, the, for the patient. And that's really what's really at, at, uh, an, uh, at stake here is efficiency, cost savings, but at the same time restoring vision and doing it in a way that it doesn't really uh, cause the person to be out of work or to, to be away from uh, the activities that they have to do on an ongoing basis. But here's what is really interesting about Jerry that I want to tell you. He's had a big week. Exactly a week ago, um, Jerry is uh, an honored member of the advisory committee for the Piedmont Triad Biotech Advisory Committee. And you may or may not have heard us speak to that before because actually the person who co-chairs that with me is Scott Sewell from Cook Medical. Scott, you just want to wave your hand here? And I don't know if we have anybody else from the advisory committee in the room, but a week ago we had a big event. We actually had an event 
uh, that was organized by a lot of people in here, Nick Meacham and Bob uh, and, um, and others. We had actually 420 people um, to a sit-down dinner with a great guest speaker who was the ex-chair of Glaxo, uh, Smith Klein, a very large pharmaceutical firm with an uh, American headquarters in Raleigh in RTP. And um, we had an award night. So actually, I'm really pleased to let you know that um, this company won the Entrepreneurial Excellence Award company. So I think we should give them a big hand for that right now. <laughs> now, subsequent to that, um, on the weekend, um, Mona Coker, with her eagle eyes, was reading the Winston-Salem Journal, and the full page is done on the OSI company. So if you're Googling and you want to do some research on this, you can see this. So that's great. So, you know, this is a really, really interesting company. Great team. I've been over there. I've met the team. Very exciting with what they do, and Jerry's going to tell you more about that. And um, so um, the only other thing I want to mention is, that, and this is something that you all need to know, Sometimes it's good to do a lot of publicity, but there's always upsides and downsides in business. So Jerry was telling us that the FDA visited them this week to do an inspection. And, uh, you know, good companies that run their operations really well have nothing to fear from the FDA coming in. And in the future, some of you may go on to be FDA inspectors. That would be really nice if you graduated and went on to be an FDA uh, uh, investigator because that's a good career, it's a great career. And it's also a great career to work in OSI or, or in the biosciences. So, you know, you've chosen the right place to be this afternoon. And without further ado, I'm going to introduce Jerry Barker. So our location is, we're, we're, down, we're downtown Winston-Salem. If you know where the research park is, it's um, at the intersection pretty much of um, where Business 40 and 52 come together. Um, it's where the big regenerative medicine building has just been built, and then they're starting to clear all the land and stuff around there to put in new buildings and everything. Um, but we're in an old building that's called Albert Hall, and it's at the top building there, and it's actually one of the RJR buildings where they actually used to put the uh, Prince Albert tobacco in the can. They've taken a lot of those buildings and started to convert them over into um, lab space, um, and companies have started to go in and rent the buildings and, and things like that. So, um, so that's where we're headquartered. We, we have two offices. Our headquarters is in that building. We also have an office in Aurora, Colorado. Um, it's just a satellite office, and we don't have – we have a smaller footprint there, which is basically the, just a lab and a small office area um, located there. And then in both locations – both locations, we have state-of-the-art laboratory facilities, and we occupy about 8,000 square feet in a, and have state-of-the-art clean rooms in both locations. And you can see down here on the bottom picture um, is a picture of our clean room. We actually do freestanding clean rooms, and so if you're familiar with any of that, there's HEPA filters and things in the ceiling, and so the air blows through the HEPA filters into the room, and then it's blown out from underneath the, um, the walls. And so all of the air pretty much, it's not a sterile environment, but it's a very clean environment inside of the room itself. Um, we are now up to, I just told you, we started with myself as one person. We're now up to 18 employees um, that um, 15 of those people work in the Winston-Salem office. Um, the 18th person will start on April the 2nd. And then we have three people in Aurora, Colorado. Six of these people are certified iBank technicians. Um, there's, I know Russ and his group have been doing some work on this um, at Forsyth Tech and maybe even across the country, but looking at how to standardize, you know, um, different fields and how you how you certify technicians and stuff once they take a, a class, give them some kind of national certification. But that's what this is, and it basically takes you through from the time that you start. Um, you have certain criteria you have to meet. You have to take certain um, classes and you have to do a lot of hands-on training. But it takes you from the time that a person dies and becomes a donor all the way up through doing the blood work, the serology, looking at the tissue, everything, all the way up to the point that it goes into the patient. And you have to know all of that, take tests on it, and be able to um, you know, recognize things that are not right and reasons that you wouldn't transplant tissue, all of that. And then once you pass all of those exams, then they'll give you a certification 
called the iBank of America um, certified technician. Um, in addition to our lab staff resources, we have sales. I just introduced you to Matt. Um, we have the quality assurance department who was planning on coming today, and they're tied up with the FDA. Um, project management um, team, and we also have a finance team. And we have a distinguished group of medical advisors. I mean, we right now we only have, we're pretty small as far as it goes. We have three medical advisors. They're um, Dr. Keith Walker over here at Wake Forest University. Um, he's a corneal specialist uh, over here. We have Dr. Terry Kim at um, Duke University, corneal surgeon there. And Dr. Neil Griffin is in a private practice in Southern Pines, North Carolina, down at Pinehurst. And um, all three of them are pretty high volume corneal surgeons. They're, and a high volume corneal surgeon would probably do about 100 transplants per year. So it's, um, you know, when you think about it, there's only, and I don't know if we put a slide in here um, about the um, thing, but there's, this is a very niche market. There's only about 20,000 of these procedures done in the United States, well, 40,000 transplants, and then 20,000 of them are the market that OSI works in every year as far as doing the, that number of transplants. Um, our mission, our mission statement at Oxy Systems is to deliver to physicians innovative surgical solutions to help patients improve their vision. Um, and that's what we try to live by on a daily basis. It's not about trying to make the most money you can or anything like that. It's about how many people can we help, how many people can we restore sight to. Um, we, we strive to be the preferred partner with surgeons, eye banks, and related medical professions, and we want to be recognized as innovators contributing to the high-quality outcomes that help, help physicians improve their patients' lives. Uh, a little history on transplantation. In uh, 1905 is when the first cornea transplant was performed. It was performed by a guy named uh, Edward, uh, Ed, Edward Zerm, and it was in uh, Slovakia, December the, December the 7th, 1905. It went for approximately, and I guess I'll start by just explaining a little bit about full thickness transplants. Um, the only way you used to be able to have a transplant, um, your cornea is the front part of your eye, which is the front, it's almost like the windshield, it's the front covering of the eye. And the only way you could have a transplant was they cut your entire cornea off, and then they took a donor cornea, cut the same size off, and they put the new donor cornea into that hole, and they stitched it into position. And that's what they call a full thickness corneal transplant. What we're able to do today, and, and you can notice, um, you'll notice right here, there we go, uh, you'll notice right here that for 100 years, it was nearly 100 years from the time that the first cornea transplant took place until we got down to where we're at today in transplanting um, just these different endothelial cells and things like that. So it was almost 100 years that if you, if you had something go wrong with your cornea, that's what you had to have done. Um, in 1998, this doctor in the Netherlands, Dr. Garrett Mellis, started um, talking about different procedures where if you didn't have to have, um, the f if it was only part of your cornea that had gone bad, you could have just that part of your cornea replaced. And so he started coming up with this procedure called DLEK, and then that evolved into, and that was cutting a lot of the cornea out and replacing the cells. Then he went to this um, procedure called decimase stripping endothelial keratoplasty, which I'll show you some pictures in a minute. But, uh, and that was in 2002, which was a, it goes back to what Russ was saying about earlier, it's, it's less manipulation to the patient's eye, but you still get good vision out of it, and so the patient actually recovers a lot faster. Um, and then it goes down into what they're calling decimase membrane endothelial transplants. And this is really, I mean, it's been, it was started to be discussed in 2006 and things, but their surgeons are not even doing this procedure right now because this membrane is only about five, somewhere between five and 10 micron thick. And so it's impossible for the surgeons to handle the tissue and get it into the eye. And so there's very few people that are doing this. But before the end of the month, ocular systems will be providing our first DMET graft to surgeons um, for them to transplant. Um, here's a picture of what I was telling you about. Um, you can see the stitches running around this patient's eye. And that's what, that's a full thickness transplant. If you look real close, you can see the little white lines. And that's the outline of where the uh, new graft was put into place and then stitched to the old one. Um, you can see how clear it is. I mean, this patient can see through there. The, um, the cornea being the windshield, the problems that you have are when the cornea goes bad or something happens to it, the light is coming through just like this laser pointer shooting through there. And if the cornea is supposed to be a certain thickness and, and 
everybody's cornea could be a little bit thicker or a little bit thinner, but if it's supposed to be a certain thickness for your eye and the, and the length of your eye and everything that makes you be able to see, when the light shoots through there, if this cornea is not functioning properly and it's thicker than it should be or thinner or any of those combinations of things, then the light gets distorted. So if you had physics and things like that, you know how light passes into something, and then it, if it hits something, if it hits something, it'll all of a sudden deflect the wrong way, or it could, you know, be um, if it's, if the cornea is swelled up, it, it, it could be cloudy. And you've probably seen, um, like the History Channel and things like that, you'll see patients, or, or I don't know if they're patients, or they look better, but the people walking around on there, and they've got um, their their eye may be completely white, or you know the cornea is completely clouded over. And so that's the type of situation we're working on here. We can go in and replace anything to do with the cornea. We can give you this type of transplant. We can give you, you know, just replace cells. We can do anything there. But that doesn't make you automatically see. I mean, if, if there's things wrong with the retina, if there's things wrong, you can have a, um, a cataract, you know, that they can take cataracts out now, things like that. But if we, we can definitely fix cornea blindness. Um, this one is, again, very difficult picture to see, but it's a good one. You, this is taken with a um, foot lamp microscope, so it's the same thing that you sit in when you go to the eye doctor and, and put your chin in the rest. But if you'll notice right here, you can see this little white line right here. It is a set of the, it's, it's a membrane like we're providing, which is about 100 microns in thickness. And they're actually, it's, it's done sutrally. So you can see that this one has anywhere from about, th this one will have anywhere from about 20 to 25 sutures right here holding this in place. This will have zero sutures. And the surgeon may choose to put one. Um, this re recovery time for this procedure is anywhere from six to 12 months. And it could even be longer than that depending on how the patient progresses. Recovery time for this procedure is approximately a month. Um, another thing to point out about the cornea is the cornea is one of the few things in the body that's avascular. And what that means is that there's no blood supply to the cornea. And so it doesn't heal. If you think about how you, if, if you cut your hand or cut your arm or something like that, when it heals up, you have really good scar. It, it's scar formation is there. And it's, it's probably one of the toughest places on your skin at that point. These never heal like that. They actually do heal, but that where those two pieces come together at never really heals. I'll give you a, a story that um, I tell a lot of people when I'm trying to explain the differences here. We had a patient that had had a transplant, had a full thickness transplant like this right here. She had had the transplant for 15 years, and uh, Hurricane Katrina came on uh, shore, and I can't think of what, Rita, or it was one of them down there. That, so um, Hurricane Katrina came on, and then right behind it, the next one came into uh, Galveston. During the evacuation process of that hurricane, this lady 15 years out with a full thickness corneal transplant fell, hit her eye, and when she did, this, this line right here ruptured. And when that happened, basically everything from inside of her eye came out, and the surgeon was telling the story about that during this hurricane, during everybody else was evacuating, he was at the hospital taking this lady's eye out. So it's a, it's a very good procedure for giving people their vision back, but once you have one of these, it's literally you have to be you have to be very careful about that for the rest of your life because it's it's so easy for it to rupture open. Um, go over a little of the anatomy with you. Um, I did a little bit on the other slide, but um, so the light comes in. So the light and everything you're looking at comes in here. It passes through your cornea, which is the clear part on the front of your eye. This white part is called the sclera. The iris is actually a muscle, and so the colored part, a lot of people just think it's on the front of your eye, but it's actually back here in the middle of your eye. And you, you probably have heard about the iris contracting or dilating. Um, it moves, depending on how much light is coming in here, it opens up or, or constricts down to control that. The next part right here is called the lens. This is where you have a cataract form. So if anybody that lives long enough, everybody's gonna get a cataract. And they've developed that to the point, too, where you can go in and have a cataract procedure in about 10 minutes. They use a little small, um, it's an ultrasonic machine that actually breaks up the cataract and everything. But it's, um, it's it literally, when you watch the procedure being done, and you can see all these things on YouTube and stuff, it um, looks like a little vacuum cleaner. And so it literally vacuums out what you have as a lens because it's gotten cloudy and, and the cataract is formed. It'll vacuum that out, and then the surgeon can literally come in here and through a... Um, 
little two millimeter incision on the side of the eye. He can put a plastic lens in the same place that he vacuums the old one out, and then that completely clears up that, um, so, so the, the light will pass through the lens like it's supposed to. When you're talking about the little piece of plastic, the lens, the uh, synthetic lens they put in, they will actually measure all your vision and everything to determine what power you need. And so those little bitty lenses that they put in your eye are actually powered just like glasses that you might wear or contact lenses. They power those so that once you have cataract surgery, you can literally take your glasses off and not wear them anymore. And so that's a, that's a neat thing. And then it goes, as the light passes on through, it goes back through, this is all fluid back here. And then the retina is nothing but a great big movie screen. And so the movie screen sits on the back of the eye, the image is projected back, it lands on the movie screen, and no matter where it lands on the movie screen, all the receptors and everything pick it up and take it to what they call the optic nerve, and the optic nerve carries that through to the brain, and then the brain transforms it into the image that, that you actually see. Um, the people ask me all the time, so you can transplant a whole eyeball. This optic nerve is more complex than any fiber optic cable that has ever been thought about. So no, there's no way right now to be able to um, transplant a whole eye. Any questions? Nobody's talking, except me. Um, the part that OSI is primarily concerned with is the endothelial cell layer. Um, if you look at this diagram here, you can see that the very top layer of the cornea um, is the, it's called the epithelium. These cells continually fall off. So every time you blink, you blink, these, you blink these cells off and you're constantly reproducing these cells over and over again. Um, so that's the epithelium. There's a membrane right below that layer. It's called Bowman's membrane. And what it acts as is almost like a guard that, because uh, this is exposed to the, um, outside environment, this membrane keeps the outside environment from actually getting inside your eye and into the cornea. The stroma is a collagen matrix which pretty much just gets filled with fluid. And so there's, it, the fluid is called aqueous humor, but it, it fills up in here and then the structure is almost like a uh, scaffolding and then the fluid is just between the, the scaffolding. Decimase membrane is down here on the bottom. And then there's a set of single, it's a single set of, um, endothelial cells, so there's a single set of cells, and you can see those right here, but they actually form in a monolayer, so it's, they're not multi-layers um, thick, there's one single layer of these cells on the back of your cornea. You're born with a, set, a certain number of cells, and it's usually somewhere in the neighborhood 3,500, you know, it could be up to 4,500 or so as a baby, and throughout life, these cells just fall off. I mean, they just fall off, and you do not repopulate the endothelium. So you, every time you blink, you repopulate epithelial cells. You do not regrow endothelial cells. So there's patients that, as the majority of our patients are older patients that have gone through life, and this, cell, this endothelial cell count right here has just decreased to the point that it can't pump. The, the, um, the action here is that these cells pump fluid from the inside of the eye into the cornea. And that pumping mechanism keeps this cornea at the right thickness. And the right thickness typically is about 500 microns, which is a half a millimeter. So it's, it's very, very thin to begin with. But if these cells stop functioning, then this, this right here becomes like a sponge. And when it becomes a sponge, it just starts to swell up. And when it swells up, again, it distorts the light you can't see. So what we can do now is go in and just replace decimase membrane and this endothelial layer which is about, it's less than 10 microns depending on you know, the age of the patient and stuff, but it's about 10 microns of um, material right here that we can go in and replace. When we put that new set of cells on here, so the old ones were bad, they scraped those out, they put the new ones in, as soon as they put the new ones in, the, they, the new cells start to pump and immediately it starts to pump the fluid out of the uh, stroma of the cornea again and bring it back down to the nat uh, natural equilibrium at which point it's supposed to, it's as thickness it's supposed to be, and then it clears it up and the patient can see through it again. Um, I think I explained all that without reading the writing, but any questions? So at Ocular Systems, we're pretty much focused on three things right now. Number one is the corneal processing, as uh, Russ alluded to in the pictures and stuff in the paper. What we're doing is we're taking a, a donor cornea and 
I probably should have uh, explained that a little bit. I'm going to go into a little bit more at the end. But the way that we come about corneas is when people pass away, we're taking a cadaveric, so somebody dies in a car wreck, we're uh, speaking to their family, they're giving consent to be a donor, the corneas come from that patient, and then it, get, it goes through all of the different processing steps and everything like that. Um, we are not an eye bank. We don't do the recovery, we don't do the testing. All we do is specialize in this pr procedure right here. Um, when tissue is donated, I think it's important to know that um, even though OSI is a company and, and we're doing well and we're thriving, a lot of our stuff is in innovation, you know, the, the next newest thing. But for human tissue itself, no matter what it is, it cannot be, it's a federal law that you cannot buy or sell human tissue in the United States. So this gift, when this person dies and donates their cornea, that cornea is literally being given from this person to this person. There is money involved in the middle, and that's what they call processing fees, and it's all got to do with, Russ mentioned earlier, the FDA and things like that, because the FDA requires that in order for this patient to give this cornea to this patient, you have to test that patient for HIV, you have to check them for hepatitis, you have to check them for syphilis, you have to go through a history with the family, you gotta have all of your processing, we, we must process like in a clean room environment like we have. And all of that costs money. The people that get up in the middle of the night from the eye bank and go to, you know, somebody dies in a car wreck in Boone and the eye bank technician has to get up at two o'clock tonight and drive to Boone to recover it. You gotta pay that person to do that job. So all of this is considered not for profit, but the, um, so the, the gift is actually given from one person to another and then that's how all the, the money stuff works in the middle. Um, OSI also, um, we do, when I was explaining this to you, these graphs are about 100 microns in thickness. So they're a tenth of a millimeter. They're very, very flimsy. Um, something that you could probably compare it to would be like a wet piece of tissue paper or a piece of saran wrap trying to fold up on itself, things like that. So it's very delicate for us to work on it. But it's even more delicate because the surgeons are trying to get it inside of the eye They're, the surgeon is trying to get it inside of the eye, and he's trying to get it up against the back of the cornea, the existing cornea. So you can see how much room he has to work with. It's not very much room. It's not very much room in there to work with. This right here, from say right here over to here, is about eight and a half to nine millimeters in uh, diameter. And so he's got to get this graph in there. He's got to get it completely unrolled and in position, and then he's got to get it up against the back of the patient's cornea in order for it to start working. Well, in the past, skip forward a little bit, um, and then I'm going to go to the next slide because I think it's going to show a, a video of what I'm fixing to tell you, and that'll be easier for me to explain to you. Uh, well, we created this device to actually handle this 100 micron piece of tissue to help the surgeon get it into the eye. Uh, the next thing that we're working on is if somebody, if, if somebody uh, needs a corneal transplant, the United States has a really robust system for uh, donations. The rest of the world, I mean, really, even if you live in England and you say, well, Europe and England and stuff, they're as advanced as we are. If you live there, and it's got a lot to do with socialized medicine and everything else, but you're going to wait about two to three years to get a cornea for transplant. If a surgeon in the United States sees you and you need a transplant, they can literally add you to the surgery list any, at any given point and we'll have a cornea for, for you or for that patient. Um, but we're working on, can we take these cells um, Say the best donor out there is probably, and, and you have to just take it for what it's worth because you say, well, that's sick to talk about that. But if somebody's going to have to have a cornea transplant, the best cornea out there could be a 10-year-old child that just died in a car accident. It's very sad. But right now, we got it, the, the parents agree to give consent. One cornea goes to one patient. Or, you know, and patient, if the patient has two corneas and they're both good, then they, they help two patients see. Well, why shouldn't we be able to take that 10-year-old cornea and multiply those cells out to the point that we could give those, those pristine corneas, instead of giving those corneas, instead of it only helping two people, why couldn't we make it to the point that it might help 50 people? And so we're actually doing some investigative work and stuff on that right now to see if that's, that's possible, and that's uh, part of the research, and I'll show you some of that in a few minutes, too. Um, from the preparation standpoint, our core business is processing of the corneal tissue. Uh, we prepared about 2,500 of these um, uh, graphs last year. 
Um, 20, 000, there's 20,000 of them in the United States. It gives OSI about 12% of the U.S. market that we're actually supplying grass to right now. And then between 2010 and 2011, we, we achieved a 14% increase in the number of these corneas that we actually were supplying for transplant. And we're on target to actually beat that number this year um, to supply more. Um, the process, I went over this just a little while ago, but the iBank uh, recovers the tissue from a donor. Then they complete all of the donor eligibility and serology testing. Donor eligibility means um, the FDA has certain guidelines and rules that you have to meet in order for, for your corneas. I mean, we can recover your cornea, but they, you have to meet these certain criteria in order for them to be transplanted into somebody else. And so we have to literally get the medical records, the charts, we have to get all the blood work, we have to get all this stuff and go through it and make sure that it meets the criteria that the FDA has set that we can transplant it into somebody else. That's what donor eligibility means. Serology testing is what I just explained about. Um, so the donor actually gives a tube of blood also and it gets checked for HIV, hepatitis, syphilis, um, hepatitis B and C. Um, and all of that gets checked and the FDA has a list of required serology results also. So you actually go through and you check all of those, uh, all of that blood work to make sure that the patient didn't have any of those diseases that, you know, that they could give to somebody else. Um, so serology testing. The way it works is the surgeon contacts OSI and they provide us with their recipient and patient information. We're required to get this information because the FDA says you cannot, uh, if you're going to transplant any tissue, doesn't matter what it is, you have to know from the time that it comes out of the person that died all the way through the process, all the way to where it goes into the next patient. You have to have every bit of that documented. And even at the end, the surgeon has to sign off that he actually put that particular cornea into his particular patient. And when, like we're, right, we're in right now, we're in this FDA inspection, they're literally pulling all of our records, making sure that everything that we have is in, is in place and that we've gotten all the documentation and stuff that we have to have. Um, we work with about 30 eye banks all across the country. So we, we have tissue shipped in from um, as far away as Seattle, uh, Pennsylvania, uh, Texas. We have them shipped in to either our Winston-Salem office or our Colorado office for this uh, specialized processing. And then once we get them, we, we, literally, we literally process the tissue the day before surgery. So if, if tomorrow, if we've got 10 surgeries, we're processing 10 corneas today. And then they literally get shipped back out for overnight delivery to the, um, to the surgeon at the transplant facility. And that could be, we, we do a lot of them at Wake Forest. We do a lot at Duke. We go as far as California, uh, as far as sending tissue out. We actually go as far as, I said California, we actually go as far as Hawaii. And FedEx is a great op option for us. And I mean, so them putting the new FedEx hub in in Greensboro, a great thing. Right now we can deliver corneas up until 9.30 at night to the Greensboro airport. And it can be delivered anywhere in the country by 9, 10 o'clock in the morning the next day. Um, once they get that FedEx operation completely uh, up and operational, we should be able to deliver up until about midnight and we'll get the same, same service. So for us, it's, that's going to be a great, uh, great thing. Um, so the cornea tissue arrives within OSI, how we do it, the tissue arrives from the eye bank. We take the tissue into the clean room environment and we mount the tissue on this artificial chamber. And that was the big blown up picture that you saw in the paper if you saw it. But the cornea is shaped like a contact lens, it's concave. And so that endothelial cell layer is on the bottom of the cornea. If you touch those endothelial cells to anything other than fluid, you're going to kill those cells. And so even though we're mounting it up on this metal chamber, there's a, there's a layer of fluid that comes right up on top right here, and you can see that we're barely, we're barely holding this piece of tissue with a pair of forceps, and we're getting, to lay, we're getting ready to lay it down on top of this fluid bubble, and so nothing will touch that endothelial cell layer except this fluid, and it's coming up through, this, um, through the device. Once, it's, once we have it mounted on here, we use another instrument, which we don't have a picture of here, um, and we actually go around and we, we take a map of that whole cornea. So we measure it in nine different places all the way around, and we actually dr we, we have a drawing and we write down the measurements in all of those nine places, and that helps us decide where we're going to start cutting the, cutting the cornea. Um, this picture here shows the, we use a microkeratome, and basically there's a blade inside of here, and there, this is a turbine handle, 
And so it's got a little pin on it. Well, it spins at so many RPMs, um, revolutions per minute. And when it spins, it oscillates that blade back and forth really, really fast. And so as you pass this blade across the cornea, it's actually, you can see the tissue right here peeling up. It actually cuts the cornea. It cuts the cap off the cornea. And you get this right here. So you can tell that that one is already, the cap's already been taken off and now we're putting it back on. So what you have is if you had a 500 micron cornea, you got about 100 microns down here residual left and this is the part with the cells on the bottom, the fluids in the interface, and this is the part that will actually be transplanted and this is the uh, anterior cap. I told you earlier that you want to, you want to, if the cells don't work or anything like that, that the cornea will swell up. Same thing here. If you don't put this back together, the cornea is almost like a sponge. So when you put it back in the fluid to ship it to the surgeon, it'll just start absorbing um, fluid and it'll swell up before it even gets to the, the surgery center or the hospital. So we have to do things like that to protect it also. Um, and then once it's done, we replace that cap that I just showed you on the other slide. And then we package it up and we ship it to the surgeon. It goes in this, uh, what we call a viewing chamber. It's got the fluid that keeps the cells alive and stuff in there. And then the reason that the chamber is shaped like it is is we can actually put this chamber in the microscopes and then we can drill down and look at the cornea. We can look at the cells. We can look at the endothelial cells I was just telling you about. And we can actually take a foot lamp microscope and scan the entire cornea just like a surgeon or the doctor would look at your eyes. We can look at the entire cornea and tell you whether or not it's um, suitable for transplant after we finish processing it. Um, the device um, is called the endoserter. It's a, it's a paddle situation. So you lay, the, uh, you lay this 100 micron graft up here on the paddle. You rotate this knob, and as you rotate the knob, it pulls the graft back inside of this sheath. Once it's pulled in there, now you, you load it with the endothelial cells facing upward, so they're facing up like this. Once it's inside the sheath, you rotate everything inside and, and ready. You, do, you turn the entire device over. When you turn it over, it puts the endothelial cells down, which inside the patient, that's the way they have to be. They're, in, they're, they're facing down when you're inside the patient. And then you're ready to use the device and their uh, set of wheels on the other side also that actually puts that in. Um, I'll stop right here and introduce somebody else too. Bob Kelly's with us today. And um, Bob works for Caltech. And so Bob did a lot of this work on the FDA also regulates um, devices and things like that. So Bob actually worked with the FDA and worked with us to actually put together all of the paperwork and stuff. And we've got, what, Bob, five or six binders that are probably this thick that when the FDA comes to inspect the device, like they're inspecting the tissue today, they'll be looking at these binders to make sure that everything we did and the way that we tested the device, everything like that is, is up to par, up to their standards. Um, but and uh, I guess another real unique thing about this, you keep talking about how things took off in Winston and stuff like that, is between our company and Bob's company, this device was conceived, um, plotted out, drawn, everything. Um, it was molded, the whole nine yards, everything that happened with this device from the time that we came up with it until it goes out the door to the surgeon happens on the third floor of Albert Hall. So it's all right downtown in the research park. Um, so we were, we, I've got several videos, so I'm not going to really go over that, but we, the old way of doing it used to be to take a pair of forceps and just literally slide the graft into the patient's eye. Now they can use the device to do that. Um, we got FDA approval and started selling the device in March of 2011. And then currently we're already up to about, actually I think we're over 200 for this month, so I think we're clo that number's probably closer to 300. And we're running at probably about 15, 20% of the entire market for these procedures. We're running about that number for people already using it. And part of what Matt and myself are both doing is running around the country. Every time a surgeon has on these cases, we try to get them to do at least two or three a particular day. We literally go into the operating room and teach them how to use this device on their patients. Um, I know some people might get gored out. If you don't, you can watch the video. But it's um, this is going to be a um, this is an old, the old way of doing it. So this is going to show you how the tissue gets put into the patient's eye with a pair of forceps. This video is going to show you. Um, so this is a cornea that we prepared. It's already been prepared, um, and the surgeon has already punched it. When I say punched it, he's punched the center of the graft out to the size that he wants it uh, for this particular patient. You can see he's separating it now. So this is the thick part on the top, and this is what I was telling you was the 100 micron graft on the, uh, on the bottom. You can see that he's just using a pair of 
force it. Um, nothing more than a pair of tweezers to manipulate. And, I mean, he just grabbed that set of cells that I just told you we needed to protect. He just grabbed them with a pair of forceps. And he, I mean, and literally all he can do is, I mean, and this is the way, I mean, he's rinsing it off right now just to make sure that there's no debris from that knee or anything like that left on it. You can also notice on this particular patient, you can see this plastic thing right here. This patient has already had cataract surgery, and that's the plastic lens that I was telling you about. The orange back here is the retina, and so you can see how clear everything is from here down. He just, because he's already taken out the bad part of the cornea, he's putting in this new set of cells. See how wrinkled it, wrinkled up it is? And then once he gets it in there, he's he put some, th this instrument right here, he actually put some stuff in there like jelly so that he could insert it into the jelly and hopefully not damage too many of the cells. Now what he's trying to do is get all that jelly solution out of there. And then you can see it starting to unfold. It's already unfolded here. And this bottom part right here is, so he, he just now put a big air bubble in it, and he forced it out the rest of the way. And then he's going to go back in and try to get it into position without, again, without damaging too many of the cells. The way that this graph sticks on here is pretty unique because he, once he gets it into position, he will, he'll just fill the entire front part of the eye up with uh, an air bubble. And the air bubble, if the patient's laying on their back and you put air in, it's like an air bubble anywhere, it starts to float. Well, the cornea graft is sitting on top of the air bubble, so the air bubble will force it up against the back of the cornea. You can see how tight that's getting now. It'll force it up there, and in about 8 to 10 minutes, they'll remove part of that air bubble, and when they remove it, the, um, when they remove it, it'll already be stuck in place, and then that's when the, the um, I guess you start the healing time. So anywhere it could be two weeks to a month, this patient will start to regain their vision. So that set of cells in that length of time, that set of cells will start to pump the fluid out. What he's doing right now with that blade is he's actually checking to make sure he didn't have any kind of fluid between that. When he put it up there and it's up there with the, um, with the air, he's checking to make sure he doesn't have any fluid in this interface because if he does, that would make the grass fall off. You want it completely stuck up against the back of the cornea. Can I use this to start it? Huh? Just push the. This video is um, right behind the other one. This is a video of the surgery, the exact same type of procedure, but it's using the um, endosurger to actually put the cells in with. So you can tell that right there, he didn't fold the graft up like he did with the forceps. He's got it still laying flat. The endothelial cells are facing us. He rotates the knobs on the device, and it actually rolls the graft up so that the endothelial cells are encapsulated in the center, but they really don't even touch each other. They're just, they're just rolled up in the center of the, of the graft. He takes it all the way back into the tube. You don't see this part, but this is where he turned it so the endothelial cells were facing up. Now he's turned them over where they're facing down. And this is a... Um, this incision size, on the other, on the other um, procedure we just saw, the, the incision was about a five to five and a half millimeter incision. This one, the incision's about four millimeters. You can see he sticks the device completely into the eye. He feeds it across the eye. And then as he starts to deploy the graft, watch the graft come out right here. It comes out rolled up, and then it completely just opens up and falls into position. And then all he has to do is, at that point, all he has to do is go back and put the same air bubble as he put um, in, the other, um, in the other procedure. Any questions? <laughs> Anybody pass out? <laughs> That's the funniest part. Now, when I used to do, uh, when I used to do um, recoveries when I was at the eye bank, the funniest thing was is you think a nurse can do anything. A nurse can't watch you take somebody's eye out. <laughs> they will pass out on the floor. Um, just a real quick slide on what we're trying to do. Uh, I explained it a little bit about trying to grow from one, one donor cornea and trying to grow enough to maybe help 40 or 50 different people. Um, we have already been, for the last three years, partnering with uh, Wake Forest's Institute for Regenerative Medicine on this project. We've already proven 
through this cell, through this picture that we've already proven that we can take the cells and we can seed the cells and we can actually grow new ones. Um, we thus far, and this goes back again to talking about what we're able to do. OSI has invested about eight hundred thousand dollars into this project so far, and then we're about to. I think it'll happen by the end of the month. If it doesn't, it'll probably be by the end of April because it's all paperwork right now and stuff. But by the end of the month, we may have a commitment for, or should have a commitment in, you know, close to $3 million that we would, from other investing partners, that we would actually um, put into this project also. And what we've been told is that this will be enough money to get us up to the point that we would be standing in front of the FDA waiting for the FDA to say, yes, you can do this clinical trials on, you, you're asking the FDA at that point, can you do clinical trials on real paper? Um, we created a new company to, to handle that, and then uh, research and development continues in, in order to commercialize a product. And then, you know, our goal is to become the first and primary source of cultured human endothelial cells. So, like I said, we could potentially cure corneal blindness, not just in the United States, but around the world if we were able to do this. Because we could ship to any country. I mean, you could go to the depths. Um, uh, Christmas, we had a doctor from Georgia that went to Kenya and did, um, he did surgery for a whole week while he was over there between Christmas and New Year's. We, tent, we sent 10 corneas with him to do surgery. He took, eight, uh, he took six of them to do full thickness transplants, and he took four that we processed and did V-sect. And so as far as we know, we were the first company to ever send anything into Africa for um, Kenya for uh, D, the D-sect surgeries anyway. And then we actually sent the endoserter over there at no charge and let them use them on the, on the patients and stuff over there you know, as a gratis project also. Um, for the last three slides here, I just want to spend a minute and, and stop talking about OSI and just tell you about donation and transplantation. Um, there's some stats up here. There's about 10,700 people that are waiting on an organ transplant in the United States today. Um, 3,400 of those are listed in, in the state of North Carolina, and 20 people per day are dying because they're on a waiting list and they're not getting um, the, the life-saving organs and stuff that they need. Um, approximately a million people receive allografts. Um, that would include corneas. That would include uh, patients that are burned and they have to have a skin graft. That would include skin. There's all types of bone that's being used. Um, they're taking bone from um, cadavers, and they're doing all the same testing that I told you about for the corneas. And they're actually using those um, bones and tendons and stuff to fix other people that, you know, you, you may tear your tendon or tear your ACL. You may be end up in the hospital, and they may say, well, we're going to fix this with a donor graft. And so you, you may have that, you know, that may happen to you. Um, more than a million people have, since, since 1961, more than a, people, a million people have received a cornea transplant. Um, a little bit of the differentiation here, you hear all the time how um, they really, really push organ donation, and um, we don't have enough organ donors, and we, you know, all this stuff. And then I'm sitting here saying, well, there's enough cornea donors. There's a difference between organ donors and tissue and eye donors. Organ donors, if you have that 10-year-old child that dies in a car wreck, if they die on the side of Highway 40, they can't be an organ donor. In order to be an organ donor, you have to be kept alive on a ventilator. And this is what's really hard for people to understand is that your loved one, if it was your child or if it's your mom or your dad, they may be laying there and that ventilator is artificially breathing for them. And so it's pumping air in and out and the heart's beating and the machines are causing all this to happen. But there's literally no electrical function whatsoever in the brain. So that means that the patients have gone, they're, they're brain dead. If a patient's brain dead, if you unhook the machines from them, they're going to die because there's no electrical activity in the brain to tell the, the heart to beat and tell the lungs to breathe and all that. And it's very hard to convince that family or that mom or that dad that that child's not alive because they're sitting there watching them and they, see, they can see all of this um, physiological motion. They see the breathing. They see the heart beating. They see the monitors, all that kind of stuff. But that's a lot of what happens is that there's not enough people that die that are in, they're in the position of being put on a ventilator and then the family's understanding exactly what's going on enough to say, yes, I'm going to consent to, you know, you removing that machine and taking the heart and taking the kidneys and the lungs and all that stuff to, you know, help somebody else. Tissues, 
and corneas are taken after somebody dies. And so that's the difference between why people are dying because you don't have enough organ transplants, uh, organs to transplant, and why you have um, you know enough corneas because there's just a different group of people you're taking from. If you were here for the last side check, uh, you heard um, Tim Bertram from um, Kinjian talk, and they're actually working on something that's a lot more far-fetched and, and bigger than what OSI is working on. They're looking at the life-saving organs. They're looking at being able to grow blood vessels and being able to grow kidneys and being able to grow livers and things like that to be able to help, um, you know, cure a lot of this um, death. Um, most people, and I probably just went over this, but most people do have the opportunity to be corneas and uh, tissue donors, and this is some of the things. So bone is used in different orthopedic surgeries, skin for burn victims. They'll actually use heart valves, and they'll take pieces of the heart valve. So they, the heart valve, even though you not trans can't transplant the whole heart, they can take just the valves out and use the valves in somebody else. So if, if the other person has just a leaking valve or something like that, they can actually use that to, to help that person. Uh, veins. They actually collect the veins and they use them during bypass operation, the corneas. The white part of the eye, the eye can actually, so if one person, if you donate, you can just donate corneas or you could donate the whole eye. If, they, if you donate the whole eye, they can actually use the white part of the eye to cover up. Um, if somebody has glaucoma surgery and they have to put, they literally put a micro valve inside of your eye to keep the pressure from getting too high and you from going blind. The little valve has to sit somewhere, and it sits on the outside of the eye. When it sits out there, they can actually use the white part from a donor, and they can actually cover over the valve so, you, number one, you don't see it, and number two, it's not exposed to the, to the environment. And then the other thing that's it's really important, whole, we, listen, we always say whole globes, but if, if you get that phone call and, you're, and, you're, um, and you know that somebody can't be a um, transplant donor or something like that, You'd really don't think about research, or you're like, well, I don't want you know somebody collecting mom's corneas or mom's eyes for research and stuff. But if you think about it, research and training, you can touch more lives by helping with research and training than you can by transplantation. Because if you get your corneas out and they give two of your corneas to one person, you're going to help two people. If you give your corneas and they use for research and, and development purposes and training purposes, you might be training a surgeon. They may use those eyes to train a surgeon at Wake Forest how to do cornea transplant or how to do glaucoma surgery or whatever. I mean, that's, that's the only way that they have to learn. And so um, you, can, you can touch a lot of people through research also. And I guess real quick, um, the, the biggest things that you can do is on your driver's license, you can put um, the heart, and now uh, I think it's about four years now, North Carolina actually passed a law that if you put a heart on your driver's license, you are giving consent yourself for organ donation. So if something happens to you and they can't reach your family, you're giving consent for organ donation, you're giving consent for cornea donation. That does not give consent for tissue, bone, all the other stuff. It just It's only for organs and it's only for corneas. The, the part it, it's good about that is if we can't reach your family and you do have a heart on your license, we can go ahead and recover everything that, that we need in order to keep the tissue and the organs and stuff viable. And that's you, you're given the permission to do that. The family still has to be reached and they still have to answer a series of questions. And a lot of times the family gets upset because they don't understand. But if you've ever given blood, you know what the questions are. The questions are, you know, have you ever used IV drugs? Have you ever been in jail? Have you ever had sex with a prostitute? Have you ever, I mean, it's a, it's a list of about 25 questions that they're not very pleasant to ask. I mean, you don't want to ask them when the person's sitting there donating blood, so you sure don't want to ask the mother that just lost her teenage son. It's FDA. It's part of it. If we don't get the answers to those questions, we can't transplant the tissue. And so the, the point that I make here is you can do all these other things, but the best thing that you can do, and it's, it's a conversation I think people just don't like to have, but have the conversation over dinner one night. Find out if your mom or your dad or your child, if they're old enough to make that decision, wants to be a donor, because I'm telling you that it's a part of life now, just like picking a funeral home. If somebody in your family dies, you're going to get a phone call, and you should you know, be prepared. I mean, remember that I'm telling you today, you're going to get this phone call and know what the answer is, because if you know the answer, the decision's not hard on you. If you don't know the answer of what that person would want, the decision is a lot harder on you and on the family because you feel like you're trying to make a decision for somebody that's no longer there.
And so, you know, take the time to have that conversation and talk to them and, and let other people know what you want. And it's no right or wrong answer. If you just say, I don't want to be a donor, okay, that's fine. But don't leave that on your family to have to make that decision. You tell them, you know, tell them what you want. And I think that's, um, I think that's our last slide. So. Jerry, I'm just going to tell you that was a great lecture. I mean, I, I was a, you know, a bio major like yourself and cut up a lot of uh, animals and did a lot of dissections and did some live operations. And just, I just want to get back in the lab. Um, <laughs> so I, I want to call a Mona Cofer to officially thank you. Uh, and uh, thank you, Representatives, for coming today. It's great. It's wonderful. Thank you all. Hope you enjoyed it. Thank you. Jerry, we want to thank you for coming today to um, share your expertise with us. And uh, as one that's just recovering from a sur eye surgery, I certainly enjoyed I certainly enjoyed your uh, presentation today. And we have a little a token of our appreciation for coming out to um, present to us. certificate of appreciation for coming mm -hmm. today. And we also have one of our precise touch journals. I might be able to use that. Mm -hmm. And down in the bottom of the bag is uh, one that is from here in North Carolina. And one of the, one of the uh, things that has taken uh, the- like three movie plans? Yeah, that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I hope you'll take that and you'll enjoy it. And so I, I just want to uh, to uh, thank Nick Meacham uh, for all his technical expertise uh, with SciTech over the last couple of years. Nick has actually announced that he's leaving Forsyth Tech uh, and leaving the National Center. And um, I, I just want to publicly thank him because he's done great work for us over the last couple of years. Nick is actually a BioNetwork employee who's worked with BioNetwork for seven years. Um, he's one of the first and original um, BioNetwork employees, which is a statewide workforce training program. But Nick has actually chosen to go in the ministry. So he's going to become a minister. And uh, yeah. So he'll be joining the seminary uh, in July 1st, on July 1st in New York City. So Nick, we wish you the very best. Thank you so much. <laughs> now, you heard Michael Ayers, and uh, he's our dean, and uh, he and the administration of, of uh, Foresight Tech feel very strongly that uh, SciTech has done great things. We hope you have, we hope you've enjoyed it. So if you have ideas, for speakers, please send them to myself or Mona Kofer, and we will look at those people seriously. We'll try to get bigger and better speakers uh, that you know that we've topped. I mean, this year we had unbelievable faculty. Uh, so Jerry, if you've got friends, surgeons, whatever, but we we are going to make this a signature uh, series for Foresight Tech. Every speaker that has come in here has delivered absolutely superb information to you. So this is uh, going to become a prime time for Foresight Tech. Thank you. <laughs>